Welcome to Christ in Prophecy and our overview of Jesus in the Old Testament. To this point, God's narrative of history is concentrated on the Jewish people, from His calling of Abram to their conquest of the land of Canaan under Joshua. In the book of Judges, God raised up leaders to call His people to rise up and defeat their enemies. Although there was no king in Israel, the Lord repeatedly forgave the Hebrews and led them to victory. The book of Ruth shifts that focus, at least initially. It says that in the days when the judges governed, a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab, when a famine descended upon the land. While there, Elimelech's sons married foreign women. So often, foreign wives led the sons of Israel to worship false gods. But the Bible says that Ruth was different. Ruth not only loved a son of Israel, she came to love the God of Israel. When her mother-in-law Naomi decided to return to the land of Judah in bitter sorrow, Ruth went with her. Occurring during the period of the Judges, the events recorded in the book of Ruth took place about 3100 years ago, approximately 1100 BC. In an era when the world is witnessing mass migration and ethnic animosity is rising, Ruth demonstrates that God calls people from every tribe and tongue and nation to be grafted into His kingdom. All that is required is trust in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and His provision for salvation. Ruth's life offers a dramatic example of grace and restoration and ties into the lineage of Jesus in a beautiful way. Our guest today is a young lady who is a gift for speaking with winsome clarity into our very confused culture. Some of you will be familiar with Elisa Childers. She is a well-known Christian singer and songwriter. She was a featured voice on the powerful apologetics film, American Gospel. Elisa also shares insights and wisdom through a blog. If you don't know her already, you'll be eager to seek her materials online. Elisa, I'm so glad that you could join us today. Oh, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, it's our pleasure for sure. And, you know, I'm one that had heard your powerful Christian voice on Christian music first, but I really paid attention when you spoke out on American Gospel. Tell our viewers a little bit about that project and how you became involved. Well, that's an interesting story. I had not heard of the American Gospel, the original one, because I was in the second one. So I hadn't heard of that um, until somebody made me aware of it. And I watched that first American Gospel movie. I think it was called Christ Alone. And I just loved it. And I'm not even kidding. The next day, I got an email from Brandon, who is the director and producer of American Gospel, asking if I'd like to be a part of the second one that he was working on that was going to directly address progressive Christianity. And boy, I was just, I mean, I was fresh off of just watching that first one. And I knew that it was something I wanted to be a part of. So I said, yes. And I was, I'm so glad that I did. I, I think he did such a fantastic job answering some of the claims of progressive Christianity, specifically as they relate to the atonement of Jesus and what he accomplished on the cross. Yes, ma'am. I could absolutely agree. And as a matter of fact, I hope our viewers will go back and watch not only the first American gospel, but the second that you participated in. But for today, let's dive into the book of Ruth. This is one of the two books of the Bible that are named after women. The other one, of course, being Esther. And unlike Queen Esther, Ruth was not even a Jew by birth. Yes, that's right. And I love the book of Ruth is actually one of my favorite books in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. I think maybe Daniel ekes it out a little bit there, but I love the book of Ruth. I think there's so much richness to learn from it. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to talk about it today. Well, Ruth demonstrates and offers a, a beautiful example of how God turns tragedy into beauty. And, and can you speak to your own experience of that truth in your life, perhaps? 
Yes, it really does, doesn't it? Because you have Ruth as this, uh, she's from Moab, she's not a Jew, and she essentially ends up widowed. And, uh, you know, of course, we don't have to go through the whole story right here, but God really does redeem her story in such a beautiful way. And he has done that in my life. And I think probably the most shining example of that is the story that I, I tell in my book, Another Gospel, of essentially being a lifelong Christian and loving Jesus as far back as I can remember, but having my faith intellectually challenged by a progressive Christian pastor who was honestly making a lot of the same claims that atheists and agnostics make. And so um, I went through a faith crisis that was really, at the time, there was nothing about it that was beautiful to me at the time. I It was very lonely. It was terrifying. It was um, it just, it felt like I was drowning in, in doubt. And yet the Lord used that difficult time in my life to uh, lead me to the study of apologetics and really begin to rebuild my faith. And so, I mean, honestly, the fact that I'm even sitting here talking to you today is an example of God taking those hardships and turning them into beautiful things, because it's just it's such a joy that I get to help other people who are going through their own kind of faith crises, you know, through the content that I produce and just uh, being able to write and speak to it to, to hopefully help some others along who might be in the position I was in before. And, and God is so faithful to do that. He certainly is. And your writing is indeed beautiful, just like your singing. I appreciate the insights that you share, that the Lord's laid on your heart, but really from your study. And, and we credit him, but I'm grateful that you are a willing uh, conduit of that blessing to many others. And so that crisis of faith that you speak about is almost like Naomi. At one point, she was ready to consign herself to permanent grief. But Ruth, her daughter-in-law, chose life to go on living and to honor both Naomi and the God of her people. In that regard, Ruth is a tremendous exemplar of faith. Tell us a little bit more about your love for Ruth as a, the person and character she was. Yeah, she's an interesting character in that she she and uh, her fellow sister-in-law, Orpah, they come back with Naomi from Moab when they hear there's food in, in uh, Bethlehem, and they go back there. And basically, Naomi just says, you know, go go back to your people, go back to your gods, leave me alone. I'll, you know, she's basically, even when they get to Bethlehem, she says, you know, man, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, you know, call me bitter. And she's basically, you know, God has brought this great grief on her life. But then there's Ruth, who just seems to constantly cling to to life to goodness and to beauty and she she doesn't go back to her people she says your god will be my god it's that famous um, you know, speech that that uh, Ruth gives to Naomi, you know, I'll die where you die, your God will be my God. And she gets essentially sort of grafted in as we see as the story develops. But yeah, I do think it's a great, it's a great example of faith. If we think about faith being a sort of trust, right? The, the Bible talks about faith being an active trust. And, and I think that Ruth really shows that in the way she clings to Naomi, she goes back with Naomi. And every, it seems like every decision she makes everything she decides to do is um, something that not everybody would would try to do. I, she could have just consigned herself to grief with Naomi, but she continues to make these choices that um, that lend toward trusting in the God of uh, of Naomi. And so it's I think it's just a really beautiful story and example of of God's sovereignty, of course, but of of uh, Ruth living that out and and watching what God does in her story. It is an incredible story. In the previous books that we've already reviewed, God had clearly established a special relationship with the Jewish people, choosing them as His own inheritance and promising to bless them. But He also intended for them to be, as I've already mentioned with you, a conduit of blessing to the Gentiles. So how does Ruth demonstrate the blessing that flowed through the Jewish people to the Gentile nations? Yeah, so this is multi-layered, right? Because with Ruth, we have sort of this, uh, on the top of it, we have this example of somebody who's not Jewish, essentially being grafted into the Jewish people, being accepted. And this is this is sort of foreshadowing the gospel being given first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, of course. And so we have these little hints throughout the Old Testament that, that God is doing something with the Gentiles, right? We have other examples of this as well, all throughout the Old Testament of, of non-Jews being being grafted in essentially to the people of God and to the, the, the Jewish nation. And then the, the sort of multi-layered uh, aspect of this too is that Ruth is the, I believe the great, 
is a great, great grandmother of King David. And of course, we know the Messiah is going to come through the line of David. And so it's sort of, it's awe-inspiring to see that in the lineage of Jesus, uh, you have certain Gentiles who God grafted in. And it's just kind of neat to see that, that you have just basically this widow who isn't even from Israel, essentially make it into the, the lineage of uh, uh, the genealogy of Jesus and a, and a woman too. So it's, it's very interesting how God chose to accomplish that in the life of Ruth and through the life of Ruth. It is. Uh, Ruth is a foreshadow, as you said, of the providence of God, whereby Gentiles, you and I, and, and all of us who have put our faith in Christ who are not uh, of the seed of Abraham uh, by direct lineage, are grafted into the family of God. And so she is a forerunner of all of us. But you also mentioned that along with Ruth, one other Gentile woman back in this era of uh, the narrative of Scripture is a prominent uh, character who is also in the lineage of Jesus and someone who, who might have been uh, a very unusual character to be grafted into the lineage of Christ. Who was that and why is her story so special? Yes, and this is so sweet. I just think that when when we really think about the the couple of women that are actually mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, um, they're not they're probably not the people that you would choose on a human level because here you have Ruth who's not even a Jew. And then the other woman that's in the genealogy of Jesus that we find in Matthew in the first chapter of Matthew, I believe it is, is Rahab. And and of course, Rahab was a prostitute, and her story is, uh, one of those well-known stories from the Old Testament when Joshua sends spies into the land of Canaan to Jericho to see, you know, what's going on. And she essentially shows uh, faithfulness to in, f in fear of the real God. And so she protects them. She actually lies to protect them. Um, and and she ends up being grafted into the, the Jewish nation and makes it into the genealogy of Jesus as well. And I don't know, I just think there's something really quite beautiful about those choices that you have such a, such a picture of redemption. I think sometimes we tend to think, oh man, I'm too far gone. I, I'm too far gone for God to love me. Or um, sometimes we can erroneously think God would never save someone like me, or maybe I've done too many wrong things. But but just look at these, these women that are in this genealogy of the Messiah, of Jesus. You have a non-Jew and you have an actual a prostitute. Of course, she didn't remain a prostitute, but that was her past. That was her background. But, but God used her. And then we have all of that documented in that genealogy we find in Matthew, which is to me, just it's just kind of mind blowing. And it really shows the heart of God toward people. It shows his heart toward redemption, which really, I think the whole book of Ruth really is about redemption, right? It's about, um, it's about that foreshadowing of the gospel coming to all people and how God's gonna accomplish that. So really cool stuff that, that it's pretty multi-layered, I think. Well, while there is no dramatic Christophany or appearance, if you will, of the pre-incarnate Christ in the book of Ruth, there is a clear type of the Messiah. Who is that? Yeah, so this is the, the cool part of the story here is you have Ruth essentially telling Naomi, you know, of course, we know back from Old Testament law that uh, Israelites were commanded to sort of take care of the foreigner, foreigner, and one of the ways they were commanded to do that would be to let them sort of glean the outside of the fields and take what's left over, essentially, and as far as I understand it. And um, so Ruth was going to go do that. She, she said, I'm going to go see if I can find favor with somebody. And so she begins to glean, uh, in her mind, what might have just been a random choice, right, This the, the field of someone named Boaz. But then we learn that Boaz is actually related to Naomi and get in essentially acts as kinsman redeemer. And so this is a big theme in, in the book of Ruth. And kinsman redeemer means one who redeems. And this is mentioned, as far as I understand it, 13 times in the book of Ruth. This is a massive theme in the book. And so um, essentially what he ends up doing is he buys back the land of Naomi and marries Ruth. Um, fathers a son with Ruth to basically keep that family uh, line alive. But uh, what, what's so stunning to me about this is that, you know, when, when Naomi comes back and she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, but, you know, about being bitter um, and God having afflicted her life is what she says. Um, 
you know, you have Ruth sort of forsaking her pagan heritage, following the God of, uh, of Naomi. And, and then with Boaz coming in, he redeems them to keep that family alive, uh, line alive, but also it's like redeeming them because they could have been utterly destitute. They had nothing. They had nothing when they came back in utter poverty. And, and so not only was that a way that God used that kinsman redeemer to provide sustenance for them in life, but also to, again, like we know, the lineage of Jesus is it goes through Boaz and Ruth. And um, which, again, just so fascinating, the connections that only a sovereign God could connect. And so uh, it's it's a beautiful story. It certainly is. And, and Naomi herself also exemplifies the redemption offered by God because Naomi, who had said, as you already cited, call me Mara, call me bitterness. She came back and as Ruth was faithful and as Ruth was redeemed and her life was restored by being married to Boaz, their child, Obed became the beloved grandchild of Naomi. And I can almost picture, because this, the Scripture describes her sitting with this child on her knee, and this woman who had given herself over to absolute bitterness and grief is now restored to joy with this new life, this new child. And as a grandfather myself, I understand that because uh, my grandchildren bring me great joy. Yeah, we just, I don't know if you know this, but we just became grandparents as well. Whoa. So my, my oldest stepdaughter and her husband just had a little baby boy. And yeah, there's just something so special about that grandchild and just even heal the way that's so healing in a lot of ways. So I, I think it's very cool. Well, Miss Elisa, congratulations to you and your husband, your whole family. And uh, I pray that uh, y'all have lots of time together with that little one now. I also know, Elisa, that you have been a very powerful voice in our culture, not just through the film American Gospel, but through your, your ministry, through your blog and your website, warning of the dangers of progress, progressive Christianity here in America, the false gospel that undermines the truth of the Bible and the person of Jesus Christ. Tell us about your work. Yeah, thank you for asking that, because this is something that is, um, it's not an easy lane to be in because... Typically what I'm doing most of the time with my book and with my YouTube channel and podcast is I'm sort of addressing the movement of progressive Christianity and trying to give Christians language and arguments to basically refute it. Because as you mentioned, it really is a false gospel. It's, it's not, a lot of people are under the impression that progressive Christians are just a group of Christians who might be, you know, embracing a broader understanding of social issues, or they might be a little bit changing their minds on some politics. That's really, I mean, all those, those things are present. It's really a movement of people that have redefined God, they've redefined Jesus, and they, they have really diminished the authority and the inspiration and our view of those things in regard to the Bible. And it's really giving you a different God, and it's not a God who can save you. And so, uh, my heart is to provide, I, I, I have a, a YouTube channel and a podcast where I interview really great experts on some of the relevant topics as they relate to progressive Christian Christianity, and hopefully to help give Christians some language and some biblical data and some apologetics and whatever they might need to be able to converse with people that they love, people in their life who might be being swept up by this uh, false gospel of progressive Christianity. And so, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm so thankful to the Lord that I'm able to do that. And uh, I've had a lot of really great responses from people who have um, just articulated that, man, this really helps me to talk to my loved one that is swept up in this. And so that's my goal and that's my heart. Most Christians are familiar with Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 because that is the passage that Jesus read when he stood in the synagogue in Galilee. That, of course, being in Luke chapter 4. But the next verse describes the restoration that Ruth experienced because he said, that he came to provide for those who grieve in Zion and to bestow a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. That's Ruth's life story and Naomi's in a nutshell. What would you say specifically to young women today who wonder if anyone loves them with a real love? Mm. Oh, goodness. I, yeah, what an opportunity to get to speak to that because 
I think that's the thing that, boy, especially when it comes to women, our culture is so confused, right? We have so many mixed messages we're sending women. Um, you know, my next book is all about these messages that are we're being told, like, you're enough. You know, the, everything you need is inside yourself. You, there's nothing outside of yourself that you need in order to uh, find wholeness or to be healed or anything like that. And, and what, a, what a terrible message to send, especially to women who we all know that we can't, as, as Ali Bastecki wrote in her book, you're not enough and that's okay. The self can't both be the problem and the solution. So a lot of women, I think, have a lot of brokenness uh, in their past for, for all sorts of different reasons. And the world tells us just to look inside of ourselves for the answers, but, but we, we don't, we're not enough in, on our own. We do need to go outside of ourselves to a God who is enough, a God who is perfect. And I think that if, if women could especially just get their minds around the fact of how much God really does love them in the only way that we can know and understand God's love is to spend time getting to know him in his word, right? Reading books like Ruth to see the heart of God toward his people. Sadly, I think so many people spend so much time just reading the sort of problematic verses from the Old Testament, or quote unquote, problematic verses from the Old Testament that might be put on social media by an atheist or even by a progressive Christian to try to show how evil the Bible is or morally uh, dubious the Bible is. This happens all the time. And sadly, I think a lot of people get their view of God from some of those posts by these cherry picked verses that are taken out of context. But when you really get to know God in his word, when you read how his, his divine hand led Ruth through that, when you see his heart toward Deborah, when you see his heart toward Esther and how he leads these women through their lives, you get to know a little bit about his nature and character. And really what you find is a God who is so merciful, who continually holds back his hand of judgment and tries to give people, gives people uh, years to repent and turn to him. And sadly, I think sometimes we only get the, the passages where you see the judgment being enacted and then people take that out of the context and they're very surprised by that. And so it gives them a skewed view of God. But I would just say to women out there, Get to know him in his word. Read the read the entire Bible through. There's lots of great apps to help you do that in a year. And before you make any judgments about this or that, you know, read it all the way through. Get it in your bones a little bit and see what picture of God emerges. Because what I read when I read scripture is a God who is loving and merciful and very, very much so toward women, which stands in direct contrast to what many ancient books portray the gods or whatever their God would be and their attitude towards especially women, but humans in general. Uh, so so yeah, take get to know God in his word, and I think you'll see that love that he has for you. Certainly you will. And I will say this, as a father, an imperfect father of three children, uh, three daughters, I should say, and you have two daughters, I would point my daughters to the father who is perfect and to the God who loves them better than I ever could. And so for all the young women who are watching this program today, we pray that they come to know the God that Ruth came to know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who loves each of us for who we are, but because he created us and because we are, are precious in his sight. That's what gives us value. And so, Elisa, thank you for your bold voice. Again, uh, you are an exemplar to young women, to women in general, for being outspoken in your love for the Lord, to being candid about some of the challenges you've had, but the way the Word of God has illuminated the God who loves you and who loves all of us. Oh, thank you so much for those encouraging words. And it's just been great to get to, to come on and talk about Ruth. And, you know, I don't, I don't always get a chance to talk about something like a Bible book or a book from the Bible that specifically. So this was really fun. I, and I, I got me back into Ruth a little bit, trying to study, go back and study it, which is so fruitful and awesome. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. We hope that you'll come back again. And we look forward again to being able to share your writings. We'll make sure our viewers know about your, your website and blog. But for today, Elisa, Godspeed. Thank you. Most of us remember playing games as kids. My brother and I used to play a lot of baseball and football in the backyard. Whenever a play didn't turn out quite right or resulted in a disputed call, we'd yell out, do over. Everyone understood that a do over would simply cancel out a bad or uncertain play. Sure, some great plays were probably voided, but that fresh start covered over a lot of mistakes and allowed play to continue. 
Ruth and Naomi certainly got do-overs in their lives. Most adults look forward to a new year because it represents a sort of do-over. We make new resolutions to finally start that diet or get in shape or stop spending so much. We've probably all resolved to stop bad habits or develop good new ones. But in reality, there is nothing magic about the transformation from one year to another. Most resolutions are quickly broken. Gyms and diet promoters know that January is their cash cow, but that most new patrons fall off long before their new membership expires. Psychologist estimates that it takes at least 21 days to lock in a new habit, and most people are simply not disciplined enough to stay on target when the habit they're trying to form goes against the grain of an existing bad habit or their personality. Radical transformation in our personalities, let alone our habits, is difficult and rare. But Jesus offers us a real do-over. He offers us a chance to wash away all the dirt and grime that has accumulated in our lives over the years, what we call sin. He offers to give us a new heart, replacing what He calls a heart of stone with a heart of flesh. Sinners' lives are radically transformed when they put their trust in Jesus Christ. And our transformation as believers gives us something even better than a lifetime warranty, eternal life with Christ. As the old saying goes, but wait, there's more. The Lord doesn't just zap us with a new and improved attitude when we believe in Him. His Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, ensuring that we are continually transformed into the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. That's why I can say with a straight face, I'm not perfect, but the Lord is not done with me. And Jesus has promised that in the fullness of time, we will undergo one more really radical transformation. When He comes again for His bride, the church, in an event called the rapture, Christians who have already died will be resurrected. Those of us who are still alive will rise up with them to meet Jesus in the air, and we will be given glorified bodies, glorified minds, and glorified hearts. We will no longer be trapped in bodies that are decaying, with minds that are failing, with hearts that tend to stray from the Lord back into our old sinful habits. As our current Lamplighter magazine describes in detail, Jesus has promised to make all things new. Don't wait. Supplies of His love and grace are not limited, but this is a limited time offer. I like your reference to do-over, Tim. I think it's something that we can all relate to. I think that's because all of us need a fresh start at times, whether with a new job or transfer or in playing a game, or even because we've accepted Jesus Christ. Everyone who put their trust in Christ at some point had to come to grips with their great need for a Savior. Well, Tim, do you think that Ruth anticipated the restoration that awaited her when she returned with Naomi back to Judah? No, I really don't think she did. I think she was merely living faithfully. As she said, where you go, I will go. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. And because she chose to live faithfully, she is a profile in righteousness. I agree. I don't think most of us have a clue where God is leading us or the blessings that he has in store for us. Paul cites Isaiah and he says, Eye is not seen and ear is not heard all that God has prepared for those who love Him. The only question is whether we'll trust in Him. And although Jesus is not mentioned by name in the book of Ruth, Boaz, as the kinsman redeemer, points directly to the coming Messiah. That is why our key verse is Ruth 4.14. The key verse commentary on our Christ in Prophecy website will explain why that verse captures Ruth's theme and highlight another important verse or two. We've been moving steadily through the Old Testament for the past three months. We pray this series has been a blessing to you as we've followed God's meta-narrative and seen how Jesus Christ is woven throughout the Bible. But next week, we're going to pause briefly on our journey through the Old Testament. That's right. Today we talked about a do-over. For the next three weeks, we're going to bring you highlights from the wonderful streaming conference Nathan planned, focusing on The Great Reset. You won't want to miss these highlight episodes. Until next week, this is Tim Moore. And Nathan Jones saying, look up, be watchful, for the Lord, our kinsman redeemer, is drawing near. Maranatha. Maranatha.